بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على سيدنا رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه Welcome everyone to our open forum of question and answer. Uh, I have a healthy uh, stack of, of questions. Uh, some came in just literally before, moments before. So again, I answer the questions as I receive them. There's, these are completely anonymous. And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to uh, enlighten us, to uh, fill us with knowledge. Uh, and that we, inshallah, through these questions and through these answers, may we arrive closer at the, the, the letter and the spirit of both the Qur'an and the Sunnah of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, inshallah. Um, there is, well, I'll just, and I'll just they, I wanted to do them thematically, but maybe that'll be too complicated. So anyway, first question in, in no particular order. I sometimes forget if I missed a raka'ah in prayer, what should I do? So the general rule is that we want to build on the lesser amount. So let us say we are praying Salat al-Dhuhr. Al-Dhuhr, we know it's four rakahs. And then I'm standing up, I'm standing and praying. I'm like, Ya Rabbi, am I in, am I in rakah two or rakah three? The, the moment you have that feeling, you automatically default to the lower number. Why? The lower number is where there is more certainty. And the higher number is where there is doubt. And in the Sharia, al yaqinu la yazulu bishak. In the Sharia, one of our meta principles is that certainty is not reduced or is not violated or is not removed through doubt. So you, we want all of our actions, particularly when it comes to acts of worship, ibadat, to always be based on certainty. So therefore, we default to the lower number, and then we build. So in that example, am I in the second raka? Am I on the third raka? Khalas, I'm on the second raka, and then I build. I pray two more rakas. Well, what if it turns out that when you finish your prayer, you had actually, you were on the third raka, and now you've prayed five. And then the Sharia says, and that's just extra ibadah for you, extra worship for you, extra reward for you. And inshallah, the prayer is valid. So that's how we deal with that problem. And this is for everyone because it happens to us from time to time. What is the prayer we should recite if the imam or a congregant makes a mistake when praying or reciting during salon, we go down to sajda? So what is the dua that we say in the sajda, in sajda to sahu? Which of course, there are different um, ways of doing it according to the different madahib. There is no extra dua other than what we normally say in the sajda, uh, subhana rabbi al-a'la, three times, subhana rabbi al-a'la, subhana rabbi al-a'la, subhana rabbi al-a'la. And <clears throat> I should also say that sajda tayya sahu, the two uh, forgetfulness prostrations, is a sunnah. In other words, <laughs> if the imam makes a mistake because he's absent-minded and also forgets to make the two sajda of sahu, the prayer, inshallah, is still valid because it itself is a, is a sunnah. At home, can my son, who is just 12 years old, lead a prayer and adults pray behind him? This is a difference of opinion amongst the fuqaha. Imam al-Shafi'i, radiallahu anhu, allows this uh, based on the hadith of Amr ibn Salama, radiallahu anhu, who said that he used to lead his uh, people in prayer when he was six or seven years old. But uh, Imam Abu Hanifa and Imam Malik radiallahu anhu do not allow it. So we can follow the Shafi position because in this case, there is, um, we want to also encourage our children to learn how to lead the prayer and because they don't practice and they won't know how. If the child, as long as the child is what the Sharia calls mumayyaz, the child is, is able to, to discern, you know, left from right, right from wrong, man from woman, you know, basic things, night from day, a discerning child, which, you know, the child here is 12. I mean, you could even possibly have even hit puberty. If it hits puberty, then there's no difference of opinion. All that is necess necessary is that the child prays the pro prayer properly and can at least properly recite Surah Al-Fatiha. So in this case, you know, we should make sure that, um, Maybe we can run his fatiha by uh, Brother Anas, inshallah, uh, just to make sure that he's reciting it fine, and that's okay, inshallah. 
And as always in these matters, there are many differences of opinions in the Sharia. And this is one of the, the plurality of the, uh, our legal tradition is one of the greatest strengths that we have. There are some matters in which there is consensus, there's always ijma. So as long as we are dealing with matters in which there are differences of opinion, we are allowed to follow whichever opinion is most appropriate and most compatible to our condition. I understand that sunnah prayer should be prayed before the fard fajr prayer. If I miss the sunnah prayer at fajr and join the jama'ah late, can I pray the sunnah after? There is evidence for that amongst the Sahaba in that circumstances. It's not the most standard position, but it's permissible uh, due to the, well, the act that the, some of the Sahaba engaged in. So in this case, you walk into the mosque <clears throat> to pray Fajr prayer, uh, and you know they're already praying. You stand and pray Fajr. You join the Jama'ah, and then afterwards you can do the two Raka'ah Sunnah that was supposed to be before. There, there is evidence for that, and that's permissible. Some people recite the Fatiha after the Imam recites. But if I do so while the Imam is reciting a surah, I find it difficult to concentrate. I'd rather listen to the Imam and say, Amin. Is my prayer valid? The Shaf, I say, I must recite the Fatiha quietly. Is my prayer valid? Again, difference of opinion. In the Shafi Madhab, we must recite the Fatiha in every single rakah, whether you're the Imam or the Ma'moon or the people that are being led in prayer. For Imam Abu Hanifa, the recitation of the Fatiha for the Imam suffices for the, for the listener. Um, in the Shafi Madhab, the Imam is supposed to pause after the recitation of the Fatiha to allow the congregants to recite Surat Al-Fatiha. If, if the questioner, the way that the question is formed, I would default would say recite Surat Al-Fatiha because it is safer. And <clears throat> in you reciting the Fatiha, it is a fard for you to recite the Fatiha and a sunnah to listen to the extra recitation of the Imam. So to be on the safe side, I would say, get in the habit of reciting the Fatiha. It doesn't have to be too long. And uh, we can remind our Imams or whoever's leading the prayer, just to allow a few moments between the waladdalin amin of the Fatiha before we start. I mean, it doesn't have to be like forever, but just a few moments, you know, uh, to, to let the congregants uh, begin the recitation of the Fatiha. Okay, next several questions deal with divorce. It is blameworthy for someone who was, is it blameworthy, sorry, is it blameworthy for someone who was divorced to not seek to get married again? If they feel they have many responsibilities such as parenting children as a single parent, uh, sorry, such as parenting children as a single parent, taking care of the elderly parents, maintaining a full job, et cetera. Seeking a spouse again feels overwhelming even if one does not have children, but is content being single after divorce and strives to live within the bounds of Islam, is it blameworthy to not want to get married again? No, it's not blameworthy to not to want to get married again, not just for those conditions, but also, you know, the pain, uh, oftentimes divorce is a negative experience, so the pain of the previous marriage. But at the same time, remember that this is all part of your risk. This is all part of your sustenance, your nasib. And you don't know uh, what, what Allah Ta'ala has written for you. So I wouldn't approach it in this very materialistic way. So I'm never getting married again. And so I'm not ready to get married right now. Yeah, and whatever Allah wants, inshallah, will happen. And you know, that way you open yourself to the possibilities because you might find somebody, even though you weren't seeking, that might be the, a suitable match. There's no doubt that companionship is stronger than being lonely, uh, even though the person in the question is quote unquote, struggling through these issues, the elderly parents on one hand and the children on one parents, you too need also care and self-care and, and, and companionship or else you won't be able to do those other things as well. But on the face of it, no, it's not blameworthy. It's, you don't have to get married. It's just a sunnah, a confirmed sunnah. <clears throat> if one does not find a potential spouse after divorce, do they need permission for marrying them from their parents or children. Oh, sorry, if one does find a potential spouse after divorce, do they need the permission for marrying them from their parents or children? No, you don't need your, the permission from your children, certainly. And uh, a, a divorced woman or a widowed woman for that matter uh, can, can marry herself 
uh, in that case. If I divorce, do I have to stay in seclusion for four months and 10 days? No, the, the idda for the divorce is thalatha to quru, three periods. Um, or in the other interpretation of the verse, three uh, clean days after three periods. Uh, so the, the differentiation will just be a matter of days, but three cycles, three menstrual cycles. That's the idda. Um, and the idda, uh, because the next question also has to do with the idda, is a great reward uh, for, for the woman. It's not um, a punishment, it's not a curse, it's not something negative, but it's an act of worship. It's an act of worship that carries with it immense reward that only women, obviously, can engage in. If a wife loses her husband, does she have to stay in the idda for four months without going out? There are so many formalities to attend to even while grieving. Does the seclusion apply to older women as well? The, the idda for the widow, for the woman who's lost her husband, is four, ma shuhuri wa ashra, four months and ten days. Four months, four lunar months, that is, by the way, we should mention, four lunar months and 10 days. Uh, in the Idda period, whether the, the uh, in the Idda period of the, uh, in the case of the widow, for some reason, this is one of those commonly misunderstood things. The woman is meant to remain, quote unquote, remain in the, in the house she was in when her husband passed. It doesn't mean she's locked in the house. It means that she needs to spend the night in that house. But during the day, she can go out for her needs. Well, what if she works? Or what if she has to go to the marketplace or the grocery store or the pharmacy or you know, visiting friends and just not being alone? That's permissible. As long as she spends the night, <coughs> excuse me, as long as she spends the night in the marital house. That's what, that's what it means. And again, great reward associated with that. Under what circumstance can a woman seek divorce? Any harm, any harm that she experiences from her husband, whether the harm be physical, whether the harm be verbal, whether the harm be emotional, um, uh, uh, financial harm. What the Maliki, the Maliki Fuqaha say that the woman can seek her divorce uh, due to any, any harm. But divorce is not something that is to be taken lightly. I mean, divorce is abghadul halal, as the Prophet said, it is the most disliked of those matters that are halal. Uh, and in my experience with the divorce cases that I've dealt with, they're all negative. I've never dealt with, a maybe once, one divorce was, was like mutual and, and civil, but all, all other ones are all full of nastiness and, and whatnot. So Divorce needs to be taken not lightly and, and, and seriously. But the question, under what circumstance can a woman seek divorce? Any harm that might befall her? Okay, dowry questions. The Islamic history of dowry, as you already explained in class, alhamdulillah. Okay, so we talked about dowry in the last class. So we'll just answer the questions. Um, in light of evening out the circumstances when a woman moves to her husband's house, what happens to dowry and the principle it is based on if the woman has the house and the husband moves from his environment? What are the dowry stipulations then? They don't change. The dowry, the mahar, is a payment that the man makes to his to-be bride. Uh, absolutely. There is no, it does, it's not reversed. It's not, it's not a video, it, it ha, it's something that he has to pay. And it remains in his dhimma, it remains in, associated with his person as long as he's married and he has to pay it. Uh, even if he doesn't pay it, for example, and the man dies, you're going to take from his estate to, to, the, to the widow the, the payment that she was supposed to receive. So it's something that she has to receive. <clears throat> doesn't matter if she's wealthy at all, and more wealthy than her husband. There are many examples in the, in the history of Islam of very wealthy women marrying uh, the, uh, men that are less uh, financially off, i.e. the Prophet Sassam and, and Lady Khadija alayhi salam, and so many of the Sahaba and others. It's still an obligation for the man to pay the mahar to the woman. It's one of the, uh, one of the pillars of the 
marriage contract. <clears throat> the money amount in dowry is so unbelievable, and so has many, many O's, so unbelievable in different cultures these days, it prevents families from coming together. I mean, if the amount in our culture is ten to $100,000, what does the groom family do if they don't have the resources? Doesn't this prevent marriage? Well, what they do is they go marry non-Muslims because non-Muslims don't have this nonsense. Only we seem to have this nonsense. So if a woman is expecting her mahar to be $100,000 and we're all, uh, you know, middle class, middle upper class people, lower class, whatever, but we have a salary job and whatnot, and you're expecting to receive $100,000 in liquid cash, mahar, then uh, you're going to end up marrying non-Muslims. Right? And that's what happens because these cultural norms are ridiculous uh, and almost, I mean, one would go as far as to say almost un-Islamic. So, al-mahr, mahrul mithl. The mahr is the similar mahr that women, uh, uh, similar women receive, her neighbors, her sisters, her cousins, people of the same socioeconomic now, there are people that, that are, play that game that can afford mahar of 100,000 and, and whatnot. But if you don't come from that background, and if you're not a princess or the, you know, the daughter of some extremely wealthy person, etc., then you can't expect that. In addition, we don't want to enter into the marriage with this idea of finances only because we're not creating a business. You know, marriage is not, uh, not you know, a joint stock company that we're forming. Uh, so if your only lens is the financial lens, oh, he has to give her not just the mahar, that's $100,000, but all of, you know, 50 pounds of gold and, and 55 outfits for the nikah and 65 outfits, outfits for the walima and a honeymoon, you know, around the, if you start looking at things material, in a material sense only, that's a sign that, that it's going to be a disaster. Because Allah Ta'ala, when he describes marriage, he says, And from Allah Ta'ala's divine signs is that he has created from each one of you, each one of us, its pair. And has created love and mercy between them and allowed them to dwell tranquilly therein. Where is the money in that verse? Where is this idea of the material comfort? When, when, when Sayyidah Fatima alayhi salam the daughter of the Prophet ﷺ complained to Rasulullah ﷺ that they had difficulty and the housework was difficult and, and she wanted extra help, etc. The Prophet ﷺ said, I'll give you something that's better than domestic help. And he taught her some adhkar and some dua. Right? This is the daughter of the greatest of creation, ﷺ. So we need to put these things in perspective and we need to strive to be like those people and to make marriage accessible and to make marriage possible so that we can have thriving marriages. As for the monetary component, risk, yes, it's important that the man shows that he's serious by coming you know, with a dowry and, and presence and all of those things, but it has to be within reason uh, to be able to facilitate the marriage. I'm a bit confused. Does the man give the offer of marriage or does the sisters welly do that? Who goes to whose house to ask for her hand? And the sister family writes the contract, right? Well, there is the, the pre-nikah, you know, the, the, the pre-actual legal instrument of marriage, which is uh, usually uh, the man will make some kind of gesture to the woman's family. Uh, I'd like to speak to your father or I'd like to speak to your older brother or whatever, her, whatever sort of um, welly. Uh, uh, guardian is is available. Uh, I'd like to come over and you know I'd like to ask for your hand in marriage. So I mean, there's that sort of social so and and those are just social norm customs. But in the contract, in the contract, the default is that the woman's side, whether it be the woman herself, if there's no wali, if she's older, etc., divorce, etc., or the, the woman's wali, makes the offer of marriage. Zawaj tuka. Ibneti, you know, the man says, the, the father says, I offer you in marriage my daughter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then the man is the one that responds to that. So many Westerners, they find that strange. Actually, I, was, I dealt with a nikah in which there was, a, uh, there was an issue with that. And uh, the Muslim side, actually, of the family, 
it was a mixed uh, faith thing, a Muslim man marrying a Christian woman. And um, they didn't understand that. And I tried to explain it to them and they wanted the contract to be reversed in, in, in which the, the man offers the marriage. Now it's legally, uh, from a Sharia point of view, that's, it's valid, still the contract is valid. But that's not the urf, that's not the custom of the Muslim. The custom of the Muslims is that the marriage contract begins from the woman's side to give women, the woman control of the contract. Because in that, that offering of marriage, she can stipulate certain conditions. She can stipulate that he doesn't take a second, third, fourth wife. She, she can stipulate, uh, you know, it's like any contract, you can stipulate the things that you want to stipulate. So that's how it's done. And that's how we do it at the masjid. You know, and in our in our ceremonies, that's how we do it. <clears throat> I am constantly subjected to verbal abuse by my husband, yet I tolerate him and have lived with him and raised my family. I cannot drag others to sort him out as it's embarrassing and disrespectful. Is there a dua I should recite? In some cultures, they have a talisman to protect one from such ha hazards. Please comment. You know, hasbi Allah wa na'am al wakil and la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. And, you know, make dua sincerely that Allah Ta'ala softens your husband's heart. Nothing is difficult for Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. Whilst doing your salah, is it okay to recite the surah in a fast mode rather than slowly to complete the prayer? It's okay as long as all of the words are pronounced in the surah. So... You know, you could say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen. Or you can say Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim, Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen, Ar Rahmanir Rahim. One is faster than the other, but in both you have enunciated and pronounced all of the letters. So as long as you are doing that, the speed is fine. Some say it is not proper or correct to recite the verses in a fast mode. Rather, you should recite slowly. No, it's, about, it's not about speed. It's about reciting, giving every letter its haq, giving every letter its right enunciation and pronunciation. And that is where you need the uh, tajweed teacher, the Quran teacher to teach you how to pronounce uh, the words. It doesn't have to be necessarily long. I mean, there are some reciters that are super slow. And, uh, you, you know, there is some danger in the slow, very slow recitation that people's mind wanders and whatnot. So it's not about fast or slow. It's about reciting properly. If one's friend is seriously sick, is it beneficial to do qurbani and ask dua? Is there a hadith to this effect? The Prophet وسلم, said, بالصدقات. Treat your ill, cure your ill through sadaqah, through charity. So when people are ill, either yourself, God forbid, or, or family or loved ones or neighbors, we give charity with the intention of shifa. Uh, reciting Quran, وفيه شفاء. You know, the Quran itself is a cure. So of course there's benefit in that. And also mentioning the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. As a matter of fact, Qadi Ayyad's famous book, Ash-Shifa, the Hukuq al-Mustafa Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the famous book, Ash-Shifa, which is a book that describes all aspects of our obligation towards Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The reason it's called Ash-Shifa, the healing, is that the book is a healing and it's in some cultures and in some times in Islamic history, it was custom that that book would be read at the bedside of those who were sick. The same thing with Qasidat al-Burda, the, the famous Burda poem, either the original Burda poem uh, of Ka'b bin Malik radiallahu anhu or of, of Imam al-Busiri, rahimahullah. These, these type of poems in which the Prophet Sallallahu is praised would be, would be recited in the presence of those that were sick. Why? Because the mention of the Prophet's name Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is a shifa. So all of these things, uh, there's evidence for, and there is uh, uh, benefit in and shifa. We understand that in Mecca, they do sa'i uh, between Safa and Waro by going up and down on motorized scooter. Is this valid practice if one can still walk 
without much difficulty. Yes, the Prophet Sallallahu performed tawaf on his camel uh, when he entered Mecca, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So whether it's a motorized thing or, you know, that's the or conveyor belts or whatever they end up, that's fine. <clears throat> Can I observe a fast on, a per, on behalf of a person who passed away? I understand that I cannot offer prayer though. Yes, you could fast uh, for people who have passed on. Uh, may Allah have mercy on all of us uh, on their behalf. That is permissible. In some traditions, people offer Salatul Janazah after Maghrib prayers. Please comment. Also, when can a person offer Janaza prayer remotely on hearing that a person passed away in a distant location? I have not heard of people doing Janaza after Maghrib. The problem with that is that after the Janaza prayer, you have to go bury. So um, I, I don't know of anyone that wants to go bury somebody at night when the sun has set. In any, it, I mean, I haven't been exposed to burials in so many Muslim cultures, but in Egypt, for example, and in the United States, it's the same. We, Usually the Janaza prayer usually takes place after Dhuhr prayer because uh, the body is washed. Like say, say someone dies now, it's in the evening. They're going to have to be washed and shrouded between now and Fajr. Now they're not going to do the Janaza necessarily at Fajr because Fajr doesn't necessarily gather that many people. And many people can't come to the Janaza prayer because it's so early. So the next logical prayer is Dhuhr. And if you do the janazah at Dhuhr, then you have enough time before Maghrib to bury the body. So I've not seen or heard of the, that's just my ignorance. I, it doesn't mean that it's wrong. But that strikes me as there are some issues with that. Or maybe they did the janazah the night before at Maghrib because they want to, the key is to have a lot of people and many rows. Uh, that is the, the, the positive sign of the janazah. So I hope, inshallah, when my time comes, by the way, I hope you guys come and pray for me and for my forgiveness. Uh, but the burial would need to take place then the following day. And that kind of gap is kind of awkward. Uh, about praying the absent Janeza prayer, anyone can do that. And there is a spiritual practice that some of the, the saintly people engage in is that every day they pray the Salatul uh, Ghaib, you know, the, the, the absent funeral prayer. And they say for any Muslim that has died and no one prayed over them. So this is something that you can do daily uh, and you can do if you uh, specifically for a person and you're somewhere else, that's fine. And we have engaged in that in the mosque before. In Ramadan, in Ramadan up to what, when can I have suhoor? The minute you hear the Hamza of ah, Allahu Akbar, the Adhan of Fajr. Um, but because that's a dangerous game, <laughs> the fuqaha advised that we have something called like uh, imsek, uh, to hold, to withhold. Um, in some of the traditions, it's said that uh, the imsek should be the time that it, re it requires for you to recite 10 verses of the Quran, you know, a few minutes before the actual adhan, just to make sure that you've swallowed everything. And, but technically, the minute the mu'adhin says, ah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar, that first hamza of Allah has to fall, has to be, fall, has to fall within the time of the prayer. So we, 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 we withhold a few minutes is my suggestion. <clears throat> In the US, there is the civic wedding by law that is needed and we have the nikah. Can the nikah be done first as per Islamic tradition and then followed by the civic formalities? Yes. Uh, and that's typically what we do in our community is we do the nikah. Uh, actually, in our county specifically, uh, what I have found, and then obviously Imam al-Rafai is more, uh, because he's actually a lawyer, uh, I, I pretend to be one. He's, he's the actual lawyer. He can comment. But in, in, in our county, um, what I have found is that the couple will bring the, the, the marriage certificate and the imam that performs the nikah in the mosque signs it. And then after we finish, they go like the next day and they submit it in the registrar. So it's almost sort of like two birds with one stone type of thing. But yeah, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. And I know that there are different rules in different counties and different states. It just happens to be in our county, in our masjid. It's, that's how it worked. 
in most mosques, women pray in separate section. And, I, and I, if they're lucky, they get to pray in another section. In ICCP, we pray in the same room, which is what was done at the Prophet's time, Salah Salaam. Correct. I, and I've mentioned this before. I think the women's section is larger than the men's section, which, to be fair, is unfair, right? It's unfair for us that you guys have a larger section than we have. But because we love you and we want you to be comfortable and pampered, because we believe that this is the spirit of the sunnah. Anyway, I digress. Uh, I, of course, like to pray in the same room as our brothers. Well, that's phrased awkwardly, but I think I know what you mean. In some East South Asian countries, women are not allowed to pray in the mosques. Please comment. Well, if we prevent women from coming from the mosques, then we have prevented uh, or we have caused a great, a great harm. Allah Ta'ala says in the Quran, the mosques are for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The mosque is not for the brothers only, not for the sisters only, not for the Shafi's only, not for the Hanafis only. No, the mosques is for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It's Baytullah. And this is where we congregate openly and freely to profess our love and worship and devotion to Allah Ta'ala and His Prophet. So Preventing women in this day and age from going to the mosque is a grave, grave danger, absolute danger. And what ends up happening is that it, it sort of creates this uh, culture in which the deen is somehow something that only belongs to men, not women. But it is the women that will end up having children and raising children and, and starting the families, etc., and that disconnect can be very dangerous. Now, why is that the case? Because, it, because legally speak, speaking, there is no obligation for women to go to the masjid. There's no obligation for, for women to wear Juma, uh, to pray, to pray Juma. So in the pre-modern world, that's how the masjids were built because society was very different. But now the society has changed drastically, and we all need to come to the mosque because it's sort of the only place where we will get our deen and we'll be able to connect, etc. So also have to understand that in Muslim majority cultures, especially cultures that go back to almost the founding of Islam, they have been through all sorts of different epochs of time and circumstance and cultural changes. So it will just take time for them to, I mean, in Egypt, for example, here where I am right now, my daughter and my wife don't come to the masjid to pray, not because they don't, for Juma, for example, not because they don't want to, because there literally is no place for them to pray except in the street or in the stairwell. Or in a, so, you know, why would my wife and daughter want to come to do that. But every Friday, I take the boys and we go and we pray. And I see, I said, there's a big, that's a, that's a, in today, that's a big discrepancy. There, there is, that's dangerous. And I like to think that what we have in our mosque uh, is not only a tremendous blessing that we should thank Allah Ta'ala for every prayer, but also closer to the sunnah of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam. Because the mosque at the time of the Prophet, alayhi salatu salam, was open in that sense, the women sahaba would come, they interacted with the men sahaba, they used to, to uh, directly address the Prophet وسلم, or directly address the Khalifa, there was no like banning of that concept never really existed. Okay, tahajjud prayer, I pray two rakahs and then one witr as I like to go back to sleep. When I feel fitter, I do offer several rakahs, please guide. I mean, if you just pray two rakahs uh, after maghrib, with the intention of tahajjud accounts as tahajjud prayer. So a little or a lot, any amount of tahajjud prayer is miraculous and heavily rewarded. Okay, now some of the new questions that I got, not that many, and then I, I'll go to the chat. Is working a job as a food delivery driver for one of the apps such as Uber Eats permissible as it seems to inevitable it seems inevitable to have to carry haram food such as pork and things of that nature. As a Muslim minority community, it's permissible to, to carry those najasat and to deliver them. There's nothing wrong with that. Can you explain the hadith about sitting between the sun and shade, as well as the hadith about try, tying your camel and trusting Allah? So the sun and shade hadith, I actually did not know until I got the question. So I quickly looked it up. And there is a hadith narrated by Ibn Majah that the Prophet ﷺ, uh, forbade uh, or disliked that we sit such that like, you know, half of you is in the shade and half of you is in the sun. 
the prohibition is understood to be a prohibition of karaha, of dislike, not of hormoneya, not that it is haram, and it is for health purposes. And Allah knows, knows best. As for the hadith about tying your camel and trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it means that you have to do, we have to do everything within our power when we engage in an act. And at the end, we say, Ya Rabb, we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for tawfiq. But I'm not going to just sit here and not do anything and then ask Allah Ta'ala's assistance. But I have to take the steps. I have to take the action. I have to get up. I have to work hard. I have to hustle. I have to, you know, whatever. If I'm a farmer, I have to tend to my land and, 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 and tend to the soil and tend to the animals. But when I put that seed in the ground, I say, Ya Rabb, because at the end, it's in Allah Ta'ala's hands. But I've done everything that I need to do. So I've tied my camel. And then I trust in Allah Subh'anaHu Wa Ta'ala. That's what it means. And that's the disposition of the believer. And this is as simple as it sounds. This is one of the revolutionary things that the Prophet Sassan brought because people, and even till today, people of other faiths, they don't understand this. It's, it's all or nothing. It's either black or white. It's either, you know, I'm just going to trust in the Lord. And, you know, and, they, and what, what they mean by that is that they don't do anything. They just trust in the Lord. Or, you know, there is no God or God is too busy with us and we have to rely on ourselves. It's, it's so funny. Even till today, we have these extremes. Whereas we have this very perfect, quite rational balance. And no, you have to do obviously the things you have to do, but you have to trust that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, is going to help you and come to your assistance. Can you give some tips about how to overcome pride? Remember often the destroyer of pleasures. Meditate on your own mortality and your own death every day. Uh, spend five minutes before you sleep and really put yourself in that earth, in that ground where, you, where we will all end up. And nothing will sober you and nothing will humble you more than the thought of your own mortality. How can one fear only Allah? Can you give some advice how to overcome fear of other things like the jinn? Well, the jinn have no strength, no, no, no real strength. In Sharr al Waswas al Khannas. Al Khannas, when Allah Ta'ala describes the jinn, the Khannas means that the jinn, he like spits doubt and then runs away because he's so timid and so fearful. You know, like if you have a, a cat on the windowsill or, or, or an animal, you know, or a squirrel, and then they are deer in our area. We have so many deer and they approach, they, they sense your approach. They run away. That's like the khannes. That's like the jinn. So that's rationally. You need to understand that the jinn have no real strength or power. In the shaitani kana da'ifa, the machinations of Satan and his minions is weak. Um, uh, but how do you fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala or rely on Allah ta'ala is, is by remembering Allah ta'ala. Often, uh, everything, every metal has a polish and the polish of the hearts is the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you have to make dhikr, the remembrance of Allah ta'ala part of your life such that the, the one that you are remembering becomes a, a part and parcel with your own being, uh, part and parcel with your own flesh, your own DNA, that is, it is, it is, impossible to un to, to 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 separate the two when you remember allah ta'ala to that extent and when you remember rasulullah sallam to that extent then they become a part of you then you become that which you are remembering not that you become allah but that you become a constant person of witnessing of allah ta'ala so you see that there's only allah you have no fear of anything else because you see that everything is in allah ta'ala's hands um for example, we have the story of, um, of Talut in the Quran. Uh, Saul, the, the king that was given to the Hebrew to the to the to the Hebrews. And what did he say? وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ ظَنُّوا أَنَّهُمْ مُلَاقِ اللَّهِ كَمْ مِنْ فِئَةٍ قَلِيلَةٍ غَلَبَتْ فِئَةٍ كَثِيرَةٍ بِإِذْنِ اللَّهِ And when Saul and his army met the Goliath's army, the people who knew that they were going to, were certain that they will meet Allah Ta'ala, 
What was their response? How many a small group has been given victory over a large group? Right? That's their initial instinct response because they are people that are remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So how do you reduce that fear? By reminding that you are in the hands of the most merciful, the most capable, the most gentle, Jalla wa'ala. Okay. And then the last question from the questions that were sent to me. A couple people in my family do not practice. They are Muslims and educated in their faith. Well, if you're educated in your faith, you'll practice your faith. So uh, we, we're not, it's not about a list of things that we know and we say that we're educated. It's about practicing that which we know. Anyway, they claim they will be judged through deeds and their moral compass. Both are philanthropic and help Muslims and non-Muslims. Allah knows best, but are we to decide when he has prescribed salat and fasting? I feel I should let go as they are adults. Thing is, one is my son, and I want him in a good place after he transitions. Words of wisdom. <clears throat> this is a common problem in the modern world and amongst people who are Western in sort of thought and deed, i.e. material. Uh, and, and sometimes they're so material that they don't see their own materialism. And by material, I mean that people only, they are adding and, and tabulating their life on like some metaphorical Excel sheet as if, if I have more of this, then I am better. If I have less of this, I am bad. So because I give, you see, even though they're giving, it's still materialistic. I'm giving Muslims and non-Muslims. I have a moral compass. I have, I have this, I have, I, have, I, I, ana, 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 ana. It's very material. No, la hawla la quwwata illa billah. There are, there are non-Muslims and there are, there are disbelievers and there are, uh, even open enemies of Islam that are quote unquote charitable with their own people and this and that. It's that's not the measuring stick that we use. Allah Ta'ala has asked of us very simple things. He has asked of us to pray five times a day. He has asked of us that we fast the month of Ramadan. He has asked of us that we give 2.5% of our excess wealth to the categories, uh, to the eight or so categories uh, of recipients of zakah. He has asked for us once in our life if we are able to financially enable to make the hajj. Those are very simple. Allah has not asked of us much, but yet he has given us unbelievable resources. If you come to, to count oh, here for the people that are tabulating, if you come to tabulate what Allah Ta'ala has given you, you will not be able to tabulate it. So how are we not able to pray? It's very, really that simple. So this idea that Islam is only in the heart and it doesn't matter, no, that's just all an excuse not to comply with what Allah Ta'ala has asked of us. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said, no, no, None of you truly believe until your self is subservient and has submitted to what I have brought. And that's why we are called Muslims, because we submit to what Allah Ta'ala has asked of us, to what the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam has taught us, etc. So, we need to remember that it's, yes, our hearts are important, our deeds are important, our moral compass is important. In addition to, we must do certain things that we have been asked. In this case, it sounds like the people in the family are older. Make dua for them. Make, make dua that Allah Ta'ala turns their hearts and soften their hearts. There is no um, contradiction between leading a full secular life trying to achieve success, quote unquote, in the dunya and being a practicing Muslim. You know, we are the people that showed the world that there is no contradiction. We built one of the mightiest and greatest civilizations that is still benefiting humanity till today. Uh, but these were people who prayed and fasted uh, and, um, you know, complied with the things that they need to comply with. So there's no contradiction between the two. The idea that the practicing Muslim is the simple-minded, foolish person, a naive person, 
et cetera, et cetera. That's just a, a trope. Of, it's a colonial trope, really. And it's, I think it's time that we just you know, gave that up because it's really not true. We are the people that taught the world that balance between the two uh, and um, that they are very symbiotic. So, you know, that's something to keep in mind. As for the specific question, make dua, inshallah, that Allah Ta'ala turns people's hearts. But this thing about how uh, are we to decide when he has prescribed salat and fasting? Allah Ta'ala has prescribed uh, over and over in the Quran. I mean, it's, it's clearer than the light of day. Those injunctions are established through, through the diffusely transmitted texts of Islam, the Quran and Sunnah. They were both transmitted in the same way. It is, it is absolutely impossible that any of that was adulterated. If you know the, the way that our sources were narrated to us and transmitted to us, it was transmitted by so many different people from so many different lands that it is impossible that it has been made up, that it has been adulterated, that it has been altered or anything like that. The Quran is established. The Sahih of the Hadith has been established. What, what Islam asks of its followers is clear and established. It's really as simple as that. We just have to, to follow it. Okay, I see that there are several things in the, in the chat. So let me just start with the beginning. Okay, salam alaikum. Who and how does one determine emotional harm? Well, emotional harm, I mean, there's some subjectivity in that, of course, uh, because, um, you know, people are different. But emotional harm, I would say, is like sustained, you know, not like my husband said something to me that upset me. Oh, emotional harm, I want a divorce. No, but he, he always does that, or he never apologizes, or, or vice versa, or, you know, things like that. So something that is sustained, and that's why you need uh, somebody to arbitrate. You need, you, need, you need the, you know, your local imam, your local mufti, the qadi. I mean, that's why there is this arbitration process, uh, which we provide. Uh, imam Rafai provides that. Uh, I provide that uh, at the masjid. So you, sometimes you need some, you know, a third party that's not biased, that, that's trained to be able to help you decipher the exact, you know, or how to interpret it. I go to Islamic lectures and see Islamic videos where Ibn Taymiyyah is quoted. Okay, that's the first mistake. I like to read more about the scholars that are quoted for Ibn Taymiyyah. When I looked him up, it looks like he was imprisoned by the majority of scholars at the time for his belief. I'm curious to know if this is someone I can learn from or not about the Sunnah. Yes, Ibn Taymiyyah was arrested multiple times by the ulama for heretical views that he had in theology. And Ibn Taymiyyah was extremely smart, uh, clever, very prolific, uh, but he was essentially a self-taught person. He was sort of the prototype of like the self-taught person. He didn't really have a sheikh or mashaykh, plural, uh, whom he studied with extensively. And most likely that was part of the reason why he made grave, grave mistakes in those matters of theology. Now, the problem with mistakes in theology is that mistakes in theology lead to heresy, uh, lead even to disbelief, whereas mistakes in fiqh or interpreting the hadith or this for legislative purposes, you know, you can sort of, like, I'm sorry, I made a mistake, and it gets corrected, and it's less uh, serious. And that's why the ulama arrested him or, or uh, because, you know, he was creating fitna at his time. Now, Ibn Taymiyyah did recant, um, uh, uh, but he sort of, recanted his re reneged his recantation etc and to make a long story so short he was arrested eventually and he actually died in prison rahimahullah uh, can you learn from ibn taymiyyah ibn taymiyyah has a lot to teach on various subjects uh, in the legal field ibn taymiyyah has offered many unique positions many of which have become established in civil codes uh, legal codes in muslim majority countries uh, such as a triple pronouncement, divorce counting as one pronouncement. And for those of you who are so interested in that, you can read my book uh, on codification of personal status law in Egypt, in which I discuss Ibn Taymiyyah's legal position. However, Ibn Taymiyyah is not to be taken in matters of theology, uh, because his theology is not Sunni theology, it's heretical and it's anthropomorphic, and it allows for the 
ability for Muslims to excommunicate one another, to do takfir of one another. Uh, and, and as you can, you know, it goes without saying, that's sort of the fuel that has caused this rise of extremism within the family of Islam over the last hundred years or so. Unfortunately, all of those groups use as their justification the theological positions of Ibn Taymiyyah. So we have to be fair when we talk about these people, but uh, Ibn Taymiyyah is not one to, be, because th it requires you to know these differences and most average Muslims can't, no, Ibn Taymiyyah should not be used as a source. Um, uh, as a source, um, or, or I won't say that, I would say it in another way. You, you need to be careful what you take. You know, if, if there's like a quote by Ibn Taymiyyah, like, be, be good, don't be bad, be happy, don't be sad. Okay, you know, that's fine. You know, and, or if you know that there's a legal position, uh, wiping over the socks, for example, that people ask about wiping over the socks. And I say, yeah, in the Hanbali, there's a position in the Hanbali method that allows it. That's the position of Ibn Taymiyyah, by the way. It's a weak position, but it, you know, the ulama have allowed it and its use. So there you go. That's something that we benefit from. But in the theological stuff, in Tawheed and whatnot, no, it's, it, it's very, very problem. It's not Sunni, I mean, essentially. Um, so one, one must be careful. Now, if you find somebody quoting from Ibn Taymiyyah all the time, that's even more problematic because that's not the way of the, I mean, there, there are other ulama there, that are more steeped in different subject matters than Ibn Taymiyyah. So if Ibn Taymiyyah becomes a person's, you know, uh, nonstop quoting source, that's problematic. If somebody refers to Ibn Taymiyyah as Shaykh al-Islam, that's also problematic. It's not Shaykh al-Islam. Um, that's something that, that his followers uh, a title given to them, him by their, his followers uh, to sort of promote his aberrant thinking. But Sheikh al-Islam, you know, like in the Shafi'i Madhab, Sheikh al-Islam is Zakaray al-Ansari. Um, uh, Sheikh al-Islam ibn Hajar al-Asqalani, you know, the people that were universally understood as Sheikh al-Islam uh, in the Ummah. So that's a little bit about Ibn Taymiyyah. Can we pray Maghrib just at sunset or just at noon? They say that may amount to worshiping the sun. So let me, my screen for some reason is dark. Uh, there are two times in which the prayer without a reason is prohibited. And it is when the sun is actually descending in the horizon, the disc of the sun is uh, descending and the opposite when the disc of the sun is uh, rising. Yes, uh, to avoid any sort of, um, uh, confusion that we might be worshiping the sun or something. That is a hadith of the Prophet Sassam. But without a previous... So let's say you woke up late for Fajr. Praying Fajr is an obligation. You have to pray it. So it doesn't matter even if the disc is up or down. You have to make that prayer up. You have to pray it. So if there's no... The, the prohibition, or let me say it another way. The prohibition is I'm just going to stand and pray two rakahs. No, just wait for the sun to set or wait for the sun to rise. But if there's a reason why you're doing that prayer and that reason precedes the act of the sun rising or setting, it's fine. Can you please comment on the concept about Sufism or the practice of dhikr predating Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? Well, there was, no, well there, there was, I mean, you mean in the time before Islam? Um, you know, the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, the remembrance of the Almighty has, has been the message of all, all uh, prophets before the Prophet alayhi salatu salam. I mean, prayer, the, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi said, la khayra fi dini la salata fi. There is no good in a faith tradition that has no prayer, salah and prayer. So you, prayer is a form, wa aqim as salata li dhikri, Allah ta'ala says, establish the prayer for my remembrance. So the the prayer that we do, or any religion does, the heart of that prayer is the point of remembrance. As for tasawwuf from the point of view of tazkiyah, of self-purity, I mean, that's what why Allah Ta'ala sent all of those messengers to help purify those people's conducts and to uh, put them on the right path. So that's part of faith tradition. Can you repeat your response to the question about the husband abusing the wife and what can the wife do to bring about mental solace and harmony?
can you remind us about Layla and Majnoon? We have some at ICSP who are struggling. Yani, the, I, what I said, the woman is dealing with a difficult husband who's abusing her verbally, etc., but doesn't want to seek me, you know, uh, counseling or someone to mitigate the problem uh, because it's embarrassment, etc. So she's sort of taken her decision. So what, what can she do? Her dhikr can be hasbi Allah wa na'mal wakil. For me, Allah is enough and he is my protector. Or, and, or la hawla wa la quwwata illa billah. There's no power or ability except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Those can be her dhikr and to, to constantly turn to Allah ta'ala to ask Allah ta'ala to soften the heart of the husband. And if the husband is there or listening or something like that, yani, akhi, yani, attaqillah. Yani, you know, remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You don't want Allah ta'ala to deal with you the way you are dealing with your wife. Allah, the Prophet sallallahu said, rifqan bil qawarir. Be gentle with those amongst you who are curved, the, the fragile ones. Because the curve, because the Eve came from the rib of Adam, the rib is curved. <coughs> it doesn't mean crooked. Some people translate it as crooked. That's, that's a horrible translation. It doesn't mean that. It means that the woman has her own way, her own style. And we as the men, we have to be gentle with that style. We have to respect that style. That's the way she is. And she's perfect that way. Allah made her that way. And I have to, so I have to change to be... Um, uh, to attend to her. That's what the verse means. And men have a degree over women, a degree of responsibility. So uh, th that, that's, uh, those are the things that we have to remember. Layla and Majnoon, that's about crazy love. You know, Majnoon is crazy. That's what Majnoon means in Arabic is crazy. He was crazy about Layla. Uh, and he would kiss the walls. And they say, why are you kissing the walls? He said, I'm not kissing the walls. I'm kissing the walls because these are the walls where Layla lives. You know, everything reminds him of Layla. And uh, that's, the, that's the example of, of love between, you know, man and woman that we have in, in, in Islam. I mean, one of the examples that we have, uh, yani a man and a woman, when they have that kind of, you know, passion between them, it's a beautiful thing. And this is the passion that the Prophet Sassam had for his wives and, they had for him, of course, alayhi salatu salam. And that's our example. How late can you pray Asr? Before the ah, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar of the Maghrib then. But don't wait that long. Dealing with acute illness during Ramadan, including COVID symptoms, how to do fasting? Well, if you're ill, you have the dispensation to break your fast. Allah says, if you are ill or traveling, you can make up the days later. So sickness is in the Sharia is two kinds. Sickness that we, inshallah, pray is temporary. And sickness that we, uh, unfortunately, is ongoing. So these type of sicknesses with these symptoms, inshallah, they're temporary. Temporary, it might be like a year or two, but it's, inshallah, we know that we're going to get better and it will go away. So we can... Make up the fast later, inshallah. So I have to say, I'm a little concerned about all of the uh, divorce questions. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, aside from answering the questions, I, I really hope that we can find a time to address this as a community, because what's the point of having this community and doing all of these functions if all of our marriages are troubled and failing and whatnot. I and mean, we want to have thriving, happy, loving, you know, passionate uh, marriages and, and households and, and happy children. And, you know, we want our like a little utopia in, in the, in the uh, craziness of the world around us. So I really think I'm gonna talk to Imam Rufai, uh, but I think we should do something more uh, concentrated on families and uh, couples and, and marriage and, uh, hopefully we can try to, to offer some advice and, and some tools and skills that will help us improve the quality of our relationships. Uh, all we are really is an amalgamation of all of our different types of relationships. So, you know, that's very, very important. And we've, we inherit things from our parents and from cultures and the dominant culture. And, you know, sometimes these are good, but sometimes they're not so good. So inshallah, I want us to I want to do something, you know, in that regard, because I don't want people to be, I don't want there to be people struggling or in pain and that we're not addressing it. So inshallah, maybe after Ramadan, um, 
So subhanAllah, we're in Rajab already, subhanAllah. So maybe after Ramadan, we can do something about that. I hope people agree or want to do something like that. <coughs> Any more questions before we wrap up? Okay. Thank you very much. Alhamdulillah. Wa salli lahum ala sayyidina wa maulana Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam. Allahumma salli afdala salatin ala as'adi makhluqatika sayyidina Muhammadin wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa sallam adada ma'lumatika wa midada kalimatika kullama dhakaraka dhakiruna wa ghafala an dhikrihi al-ghafilun Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh Take care